Ask an elderly person what an arcade game is, and after several seconds of intense frowning, they'll often say one thing. Pac-Man. Well, they might say Pac-Man, or they might say that little pizza thing that eats the dots. They may act out a mime, going blip, 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 holding a clawed hand at your face. Or they may simply wander off into a supermarket with a loaf of bread, hoping to feed the toilet ducks. It does rather depend on your elderly person and their condition, but I digress. The point is, even at the ripe old age of 44, the granddaddy of video games is still very much alive and kicking. Thanks to Pac-Man's influence and that of fellow luminaries like Pong and Space Invaders, we've continued to enjoy the beautiful simplicity of arcade games for decades, to the point where today, and despite there being very few actual arcades anymore, the games have arguably never been better or more accessible. So, allow me to take you through another list of great arcade games that you can pick up and play today on all our modern machines. Let's start with a preview look at a game which I think could do really well. Victory Heat Rally is the type of game that us arcade fans have been sorely missing for years, namely a colourful knockabout racer with a great selection of cars, tracks and excellent handling. Seriously, look at this thing. It looks like Outrun shagged micro machines and had little car babies. I've had a good few hours with the game and I'm impressed with how it handles. The regular drifting you can see here is accomplished by holding down your choice of button, separate to the brakes, and after a few minutes it becomes second nature to adjust your speed and arcs through the corners, weaving in and out of competitors. I love the pixel art look and the track design, which features jumps and water hazards amongst other obstacles. Even at this early stage, the frame rate is rock solid across every mode, no matter how busy things get on the track. I'm also delighted to say that there'll be four player split screen multiplayer at launch, and with 36 stages across 12 locations, there should be plenty to entertain even single players for a good while. There's a demo available now on Steam, so please do check this out if you can. After the lukewarm reception to the 2014 Strider remake, I'm pleased to be able to get back to punishing pixel art with something of a spiritual sequel to Capcom's original platform slasher classic. Cannon Dancer Osman was released into the arcades in 1996 and has never had a home conversion until this point. That might be because the game is, by default, really bloody hard. Every few seconds you're fighting ninja types from all sides, gun turrets, cars falling on your face, bosses, or you've got a tiger up your ass. There are only six stages, but anyone who completes this game on a standard setting using less than about 25 credits is an arcade master, and I bow to your expertise. For the rest of us, there are save states for a breather every now and again as you progress, and if everything really is still getting on your tits, you can enact various cheats, like infinite special moves, double jumps, or even invincibility. I know it's not the way the game is meant to be played, but if you just want to smash through the enemies after a hard day's work, enjoying those crunchy arcade sound effects and the excellent animation, I really couldn't blame you. The one sticking point here is the price of admission. 25 quid. That's about 30 USDs or Euros, 160 Brazilian Reals, 1000 Turkish Lira, 2000 Mozambican Metikals, and probably a shitload of whatever the hell they use as currency in Tajikistan. The point being, it's pricey. I'd advise you to wishlist and wait for a discount. If you really want to let loose, and you can't go wrong with a good twin-stick shooter, and the team behind the PS4's Resogun and the PS5's Returnal have got just such a thing for you here. I love the simplicity and the pace this game moves at. Everything is silkier than a silkworm's silk pyjamas, and you can't help but want to plough further and further on. It's one of those games where you get in the zone and everything just feels instinctive and right. There are no real complications to obstruct your fun here. 
no skill trees, no creator character with a Mohican and a pair of stupid golfing trousers, and no bullshit intrusive story about a boy who saw his tortoise explode in front of him and that's why he's a hardened killer today. The game just gets on with it, and it's just as good in single player as it is with two sharing the screen. Throughout a pretty hefty campaign, you'll try to save hostages before they're killed by monsters, gather power-ups to improve your base weapon, and complement your firepower with rocket launchers, lasers and smart bombs, amongst other goodies. You can also dash through certain obstacles and melee with swords you find hidden in crates. The level design changes up a lot more than you have any right to expect in a game like this, with multiple environmental hazards, obstructions and random enemy placement to test your reflexes over and over, and yet nothing ever feels unfairly overwhelming. You can pick up Next Machina for just a handful of coins these days, and if all you want is to slouch on the sofa with something simple and addictive to while away an hour or two, this is a great choice. I first bought the original Skydrift on the Xbox 360 in 2011, but I wouldn't have done if I'd realised that the game had no split-screen multiplayer whatsoever. I think I just assumed that an attempt to make Mario Kart with planes would surely feature one of the most important features in Nintendo's Evergreen series. How young-ish and naive I was. Fast forward 10 years to 2021 and it appears that someone finally noticed that something was missing and we now have the 4 player split screen local multiplayer that really should have been there all along. Skydrift Infinity is a lot of fun. It seems reductive to say it but it really is Mario Kart with planes. The main focus is racing through a variety of largely excellent courses using several weapon types to gain and maintain your advantage but instead of throwing turtle shells and leaving clumps of slippery potassium strewn about the track, you'll be using more conventional arms like machine guns, missiles and mines. As you progress through the single player campaign you'll unlock a wide variety of new planes and several liveries for each of them. The differences aren't hugely pronounced, but there are definitely a few that turn tighter or reach a higher top speed. Sadly the campaign is also relatively quick to highlight another standout problem that was present in the original game, specifically a lack of places to race. What's here looks and plays great with some clever shortcuts, and it's enough for the occasional evening of split screen carnage, but after an entire decade it's disappointing that no new locations were added. Maybe we'll get some new maps in 2031. Mario can still smugly tweak his moustache as the king of carters, but given the regularly discounted price and the fact that there are so few 4 player games of this type for anyone who doesn't play on Switch, Skydrift Infinity is still worth a look. Some viewers may have noticed that the sequel to this game is just released across all the modern formats, and it looks like a fantastic update. But when the original game is this good, and only half the price of the new version, I'm more than happy to recommend that you try this first. Developer Galaxy Trail really know their pixel art, and they've put together a sizeable package to show it all off. There are 14 levels in Freedom Planet, most of which are divided into two stages, and completing these levels can take you anywhere between 10 and 25 minutes depending on how interested you are in seeking out all the secrets and alternative routes. It makes Sonic look like a Flash game. Of course, longevity means nothing if the level design is more boring than a TED talk about Belgian cabbage farming in the 60s, but I'm pleased to say that Freedom Planet is overwhelmingly time well spent. Like all the best arcade platformers, there's a pleasing sense of speed when you really want to get going. Movement isn't quite as tight as, say, the original Sonics, with the occasional jump proving tricky to judge, but after a while you learn to compensate for the difference in momentum and I never found the controls frustrating. You can choose from two characters initially, with the third unlocked fairly early on in the campaign, and they do all offer something a bit different in terms of attack and traversal. Carol the Wildcat's motorbike is a particularly good time for getting around, including up sheer cliff faces. The story holding this game together is fully voice acted throughout, and while it can be a bit cutesy pukesy, we've all had to sit through worse in platform games, and you can skip forward to keep the action going. All in all, this is a tight, great looking and generous package for gamers of all ages, and I'm looking forward to seeing what Galaxy Trail choose as their next project.
Developed by the reliably experimental Grasshopper manufacturer, the guys behind No More Heroes and Lollipop Chainsaw, Cinemora EX is a game I may not be pronouncing correctly. But this is my video, so bollocks. This is another update of a game from the 360 PS3 era, and as you can see it looks incredible. The pin shop visuals never lapse once throughout the entire campaign, and the variety of locations and the way you move through them are amongst the best I've experienced in a game of this type. Aside from the excellent graphics, the other main draw here is the twist on traditional shmuppery, in that when you get hit you don't lose a life, you lose time. And your power-ups will piss off around the screen, which you'll need to gather up again quickly, of course. If the timer hits zero, you finally blow up. You regain vital seconds by destroying enemies or by breaking bits off bosses, and this design choice creates an interesting dynamic where you have to balance aggression with evasion before your time is replenished again at the next checkpoint. When things get really hot you can slow down time to avoid the unavoidable, but this feature is strictly limited and requires power-ups to fuel. There's a fairly adult story here told by a weird and wonderful selection of anthropomorphic animals, but you can accelerate through the text and cutscenes if you're just here for the action, or you can avoid the story altogether if you choose the arcade mode. As you progress you'll unlock more characters and ships that can be combined for different attack options, and the local two-player, which was missing from the original version of the game, adds longevity to proceedings as always. Cinemora EX is an extremely polished modern shooter wrapped in some stunning original artwork, and features some enjoyably rare ideas. And it's almost always on sale. My copy only cost three quid from the PS Store. I'll freely admit that I was ready to hate Gigabash. There was something about the marketing that suggested the game was going to be yet another live service cesspit of microtransactions, and loot boxes that open with obnoxious animations and sound effects, only to find that you've been given a pair of worthless socks for the 17th consecutive time. But I was wrong. Gigabash is in fact a fully featured arena fighter that at its best took me back to my Power Stone days on the Dreamcast and you certainly don't need to play it online to enjoy it. Once you've got a few fights under your belt, the combinations you can pull off are fantastic. You might wade in with a few punches, slam the ground with a heavy attack, and then just as your opponent is getting to their feet, lob an entire power station in their face, before transitioning into a supersized version of yourself, smash open a floating bonus ball and call down an avalanche. Every character has obvious strengths and compromises, and the wide variety of detailed stages are a toy box of throwable pain, complete with dynamic hazards like floods, lava and sandstorms. The story mode is a surprisingly engaging little objective-based diversion in single player, squashing puny humans, using their tanks against them and levelling their cities before the inevitable boss fight. Onslaught is your traditional Horde-style wave mode, fighting off increasingly tough and numerous opponents, but Mayhem is a great choice if you're looking to play locally with four, cycling through a number of minigame bouts with specific rules until someone wins a set number of rounds. Gigabash has a real focus on gameplay, and it won't try to sell you endless crap or block access to better features behind a paywall. There are two chunks of paid DLC, each adding four new characters, including the big man himself, Godzilla, but they're not offensively priced and there's no pay-to-win character. At the time of recording, the game is free to access if you have PS Plus Extra, or just like almost everything else on this list, it's regularly on sale if you play on other platforms. It's estimated that 520 million copies of Tetris have been sold on various formats since its humble conception in 1985, when it was designed simply to amuse a lone Soviet software engineer. There are probably Amazonian tribes otherwise untouched by civilization that are playing Tetris on battered original Game Boys. Politicians hum the theme, even your mum loves Tetris. It's one of those perfect inventions that people often forget ever needed inventing in the first place, like the wheel, the light bulb, or soda stream. 
Despite first arriving in 1991, Puyo Puyo is somewhat less well known, I think it's fair to say, but it shares a DNA with Tetris that makes their coming together here an extremely colourful and addictive proposition, especially with two or even four players going head to head. The basics are easy, creating lines or giant Puyo blobs to clear your screen, but you're presented with a great selection of twists here, like swapping between the two game styles every few seconds, using both on the same screen, completing screens with only one type of shape against the clock, and best of all, scuppering your opponent with a variety of obstacles as you eliminate the most lines or blobs possible in one go. It's not immediately obvious, but each of the characters have certain attacks and defences you can employ and learn to anticipate in any given challenge. For newcomers, it's worth going through the adventure mode that will lay out the basics for you and eventually become a really good challenge in its own right. Puyo Puyo Tetris is especially good at getting people involved who wouldn't normally consider themselves gamers, and you can strip it all back to the base versions of the games if that idiot your best friend is dating for some reason just doesn't get it. There is a 2020 sequel to the game available, but for what it really adds to the formula, I'm not sure it's worth paying for the upgrade. Still, neither game should really break the bank these days, so take a look on your choice of digital store, and you won't go wrong with either. The title may sound like some kind of budget underpants brand, but this arcade cute em up that's really a thing, has been a well-loved series in Japan for over 30 years. If you can stomach the typical anime screeching, it's worth watching the cutscenes between levels for 100% of your recommended daily intake of mental. In short, the titular heroine is obsessed with these giant sweets called willows. Thing is, she keeps losing the bloody things and has become convinced that all the strange creatures of the world have been stealing them from her. And so you embark on a quest with Cotton and her bizarre friends, tracking down willows and, ultimately, type 1 diabetes. This is one of those games that you want to keep pushing through simply to see what oddity lies around the next corner. Every stage looks great, and you dispatch enemies with a clever mix of weaponry that you can improve and alter on the go, simply by flying into crystals that change colour when you shoot them to indicate their properties. You can hold three such crystals at any one time, choosing a combination of firepower that works for you. To mix things up a bit, some characters have only one weapon type and instead rely on your dexterity to collect time crystals in order to progress, or require you to keep a combo going to build the maximum damage output. It may not always look like it here, but the game is actually a lot more relaxing than many traditional scrolling shooters and it's perfect if you only have 20 or 30 minutes spare. It isn't the longest game, shooters rarely are, and it's only single player. But there are several unlockable stages to discover, along with a brand new character and the promise of 23 relatively achievable trophies or achievements. And best of all, you can ride a pufferfish. Sold. And finally, here he is. You can probably play Pac-Man on a toaster somewhere in Japan. In fact, it's probably playable on a toilet or built into the base of a novelty dildo. Just when you think you've seen it all with Pac-Man, along comes another version to tweak the genius formula again. And for my money, Pac-Man Championship Edition 2 is definitely one of the better modern segues. The key thing here is that the game doesn't stray too far from what we all know and love about the series. Very wisely, it's all played out in crisp 2D, with the third dimension only used for excellent flashy multi-chomps and for jumping between levels. There's a clever balance of risk and reward at play, in that you can antagonise tens of ghosts on some levels, creating dangerous mass trains of death that threaten to corner you, but nosh that magic pill in time and the flip side is a truly massive score, and this loop keeps getting more addictive as you work your way through the increasingly fiendish levels. Further occasional modern touches like jumps and bombs that send you straight to the fruit or power pill at a cost to your points are a nice touch. And yes, those classic tunes and sound effects are here too, respectfully updated for modern TVs and soundbars. I think we're all getting a bit tired of the endless sequels and reboots in certain video game franchises, but here's one example of an update that respects your time, your expectations and your wallet.
So, there you have it. Another 10 games that shouldn't break the bank and represent great value for when you're looking for something quick and easy to play. Please let everyone know what arcade games you play in the comments below and leave me a like if that's not too much trouble. I'll also be delighted if you want to subscribe. Either way, thanks for watching and I'll be back with more video games action, retro and modern, very soon.